So I was warned by Chaturan not to focus at these lights, but uh, <laughs> quite, quite strong. Uh, OK, why smart cities? Uh, I'll, 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 I'll start off my uh, presentation explaining you uh, the reason why people are trying to build smart cities. I think some of you are aware of these things, but for the entire audience to understand. Um, we have uh, three custom examples from Europe uh, and also one from uh, uh, Brazil. Uh, but the three examples are, are really, really good, relevant uh, for this audience. We will talk about that. Uh, and, and then uh, the, uh, uh, the advantage of using our technology, of course. Uh, so you will have some idea of why they really went ahead and did that. So why uh, smarter cities? Uh, so smarter cities are, 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 are really interesting these days because uh, every city uh, wants to be uh, competing with every other city and uh, they are now having the habit of uh, coming up with solutions that uh, uh, make it interesting uh, to, to uh, uh, you know, people using public transport and, and things like that. Uh, but also, uh, how about making a city efficient? in the terms uh, of, uh, say, energy consumption and, and so on and so forth, many areas that people are looking at. But uh, there are some of the usual suspects, like transport sector is, is, is um, uh, you know, um, uh, more uh, uh, into using uh, IT and, and uh, improving uh, the kind of efficiency of the system. Or um, you find uh, administration uh, capabilities around the city trying to be more smart, uh, giving people the ability to interact with their mobile phones or things like that. You know, those are like the, the common suspects. Uh, but then there are some interesting projects, um, uh, uh, which I have on slides, uh, where people have gone to a little beyond that. And also using our tools, which is quite interesting. So traditional models of city, uh, like handling a city, uh, fails with uh, the increase of population. Uh, the, and and, and, and uh, you know the, the public sector uh, is, is also a very very competitive place. <laughs> uh, you know regulators and uh, Europe as a whole uh, is, is coming up with lots of standards, policies, processes, you name it. Uh, they are going after each and every little little part of uh, every country and saying, you know you need to comply with these 10 or 20 different things. And uh, you also need to be uh, efficient. Uh, you also have to reduce uh, pollution, uh, you have to improve air quality, you have to uh, then uh, do these, these, these additional things as well. And then the people running these institutions are also politicians. They have uh, their own promises that they make uh, to people. And they say, you know, when I get into power, I will do these things for you. And that list comes on as well. And these people don't stay in office for too long. You know, it's, it's useful if they stayed for like a century or so, like the queen. But uh, in this case, um, uh, because in the society, uh, when, when people get re-elected, uh, if a new person comes in, he comes up with some contradicting set of requirements. And all of these things get translated into being uh, smart cities and uh, all of these challenges people have to meet uh, in these institutions in order to deliver those promises, deliver the expectations of uh, uh, the countries, uh, Europe as a whole, and so on and so forth. So there's lots of challenges people have. Uh, then uh, the people, the community, they expect a better service. Now, um, we were not born with mobile phones. Mobile phones came after we were born. But there are some children nowadays who are born after the mobile phone, after the smartphone. Uh, so these people are growing with smartphones. So if there is a city uh, that, that cannot provide the interaction of that sort, you know, the, this new um, uh, set of now kids will um, someday be people like us. They will walk up and tell, you know, your service is uh, uh, not that good. Uh, so the city cannot wait for that to happen. Uh, they cannot lose confidence uh, of the people. So they need, to, they need to address these kinds of requirements as well. And then everything around the city is digitally transforming. There are financial institutions digitally transforming. There are energy grid providers digitally transforming. There are utility companies digitally transforming. There are transportation companies digitally transforming. Schools are digitally transforming. You name it, uh, everything is digitally transforming. So the city also has to play a role in this whole digital transformation process because uh, everybody is now digital. They are needing the city to integrate with the services they provide, right? So the city has to come up to that level as well. This is another driving force towards uh, building smart cities. 
So let's take an example that is quite close, London. So I don't know whether you have seen these things, but there is something called a London data store. Uh, London data store um, uh, is this, this view of the data store is about uh, jobs and housing and, and uh, so and so forth. It, it gives you some stats and all. But uh, it, it gives you lots of uh, key uh, statistics uh, about uh, what each uh, council does, uh, what capabilities they have, uh, lots of pretty graphs, data, and so and so forth. So if you are in uh, research, more or less, you would have definitely seen this page. Uh, if you are a utility company, or if you have some kind of a mandate to meet certain certain things, you would have provided uh, for this page. Uh, or else, if you were a person developing an interesting mobile app these days, you would have definitely come across this page. So these communities already know these things. But in the future, uh, the Greater L L L London Authority, the GLA, believes that these things will be services that are integrated in day-to-day -day life. So nowadays, this is a set of stats. Uh, presentations, uh, you know, APIs, things like that, uh, which gives you uh, pockets of information. In the future, this is going to be a very interactive experience where the, uh, me as a person living in London or um, some of you as people coming into London can actually interact with these uh, data sets and, and get, um, uh, uh, you know, like something out of it. Uh, you actually do interact with some of these data sets, to be honest, like uh, TFL, uh, the underground, um, uses some of this uh, data uh, to publish service statistics and, and so and so forth. So if you want to get to know whether this is a good time to be on the tube on this line, TFL has a status update that says this is congested or this is partly closed or there is something that happened somewhere else that, that has affected another part of the network. All of these things are statistics, data being presented to you in a way that you can uh, interpret it and that's convenient for you. So if you were to Google search and find out whether the tube is not running today, that's not that convenient, right? So that's about the dashboard, that maybe it, it sounds not that useful, but that dashboard or the updates that come on the mobile phone, everything is powered by these data sets. OK, let's get a little bit further. Now, this is about a housing map. Now, this uh, gives you uh, an ability to select an area of London uh, and, and uh, select several things like uh, schools close by, crime rates, and so and so forth, or the cost of living, and then find the best place to live. Now, my first set of examples was about individual data sets, like TFL using their own data feeds to tell you the status updates and so and so forth. Now, this is a mashup. This takes multiple data sets coming from different sources and, and, and combines this data to giving you a much more interactive experience. This is second level. So these things are the ability for you to use multiple services that are provided by the city uh, or various institutions, combine them together, and now you get a better service out of it, right? Uh, so being smarter is, is not just about kind of meeting the demands in an isolated way. It's about meeting the demand in an overall way, right? So this is another advantage. Now let's get to the, now something a little bit more interesting than this. This is a project that we actually did with TFL. Now this is uh, TFL because they, TFL is very well known for the underground uh, and the red buses. Uh, and also the boats, <laughs> a few boats that they run on the Thames. Uh, and, and they also manage a lot of road network. There is, um, I don't know if you've noticed, uh, some of the roads in London, if, you, uh, if, if you're from London, you would know, there are the, these things what are called red routes. Or if you step outside, I think, High Street, Ken, um, the, the Kensina, I mean, maybe there is like a, a road that is marked red. All of these roads marked red are uh, run by TFL. They are responsible for the uh, parking on these streets, they are responsible for the utilities, the, the you know, like road works and all of these things on the streets. Uh, they have to make sure that these roads are operating all, always. Or if there is an interruption, they need to manage it very well. Now, TFL does not do all the road works, mind you, on those streets. There are water companies, there are gas companies, there are electricity companies. Uh, there are emergency road works people who come and fix certain, certain things, like potholes and so and so forth. Um, so they don't do everything themselves. They outsource it. They distribute it or they collaborate with their partner network. And then there are people who want to make use of the roads in the most efficient way, right? And uh, uh, um, you know, like the public services. Uh, who wants to keep running the you know, transportation and so on and so forth on these roads, also need to understand uh, where the roads are closed, um, how should I optimize my routes likewise. Now to do these things, they combine multiple data sets, they run a lot of uh, smart queries, like complex event processor rules actually, uh, to understand 
uh, how can a roadworks in, in a specific area create a, an impact on another part of the city? So they are not just combining multiple data sets. They also run some rules. They run some simulations. Uh, and, 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 and then um, uh, make a choice of, do you want to go ahead and do that right now, or do you want to wait for a little later until uh, things settle down? And they can also test certain certain things. Like sometimes, some intersections have got three lanes coming into it, and two lanes are turning. One lane goes straight. So if there is a road works on the, you know, like the lane going straight sometimes, they can switch the, uh, the, uh, the, the layout of the, the intersection, saying that two lanes forward, one lane left, right? Uh, they can be a little bit efficient in the way they do things. So these were not things that are traditionally possible. And there is also another interesting thing TFL is looking at. They also control all of the traffic lights uh, on these red routes. Now, when traditional traffic lights work, you know, they work on a specific sequence. Now, if there is a roadworks happening, you know the traffic light sequence always get in the way of roadworks. You find a, a street where there are lots of roadworks carrying out, then you go and hit the red light always. If you're a driver, you'll be really annoyed, right? So how can TFL improve that situation? So they can resequence the traffic lights uh, based on the kind of knowledge that they have. So they can go to level three, level four with the, you know, being smart with the kind of data they have. So this is about it. And uh, this uh, project that we do with them gives them better coordination of roadworks. Uh, there is an improved experience for local councils because not every part of London belongs to one council. There are different councils responsible for various areas. So they need to keep up with what's happening in their area. They get lots of statistics. Just by observing this, they can collect lots of information, give it uh, to people, you know, like print out brochures and hand it out all by this, you know, these convenient UIs. And, and, and then it gives greater convenience uh, for the utility companies carrying out works and also for the road users to get a very good picture of what's happening. So we did a hackathon with TFL to explain. Now, I was talking about third level or fourth level kind of interactions with data sets and being smart. Now, this is even beyond that. So TFL did a hackathon uh, with the King's College uh, and uh, the mayor's research team for improving air quality. Uh, because uh, roadworks or congested streets all contribute to uh, poor air quality in the city. Uh, so King's College uh, is a research institution. Uh, they have got some air quality sensors measuring the impact of uh, you know, vehicles um, uh, polluting the air. So they've got, I don't know, a certain number of sensors uh, around the city in various places. Uh, making use of those data feeds, uh, making use of uh, the kinds of uh, you know, information that you get from traffic lights, sensors, and things like that, uh, insight that we get from all of these roadworks, uh, the way the, the movement of people in uh, the underground, so and so forth, we presented TFL. Uh, a solution uh, that can predict what is the best route to cycle, uh, what is the most optimum route to walk, and so on and so forth. And also, we could even predict the kind of traffic movement that in the next 15 minutes or 30 minutes, this junction is going to be congested. There's going to be pollution here caused by these, these, these situations. Now, TFL has a response team uh, that can uh, react uh, to incidents that happen. And often they rely on people to, you know, call them and tell, or some kind of, uh, you know, like th th they've got some cameras looking at some popular intersections. We call them jam cams. Uh, they they try to observe whether the traffic has already, you know, be, be, uh, like is it already congested, and they realize something has gone wrong somewhere, and they send a response team to handle that. Now, if you can take a look of the abnormal traffic patterns, and even before someone reports this or someone in the operating center sees a a traffic block, right? Uh, they can be a little bit proactive in dealing with the situation. And this improves their efficiency significantly. Uh, they can proactively, uh, you know, like uh, understand whether they need to keep a team ready uh, for a response. Uh, they can cut back the, you know, like the congestion in certain areas. They can improve air quality as a result of that. Uh, and at the same time, if they have a very good UI like we have, they can also broadcast what they are doing to the general public, which is all good. And we did this, mind you, in one week. We did it actually in one week. The Sumedha was a part of this team, so he can talk about it. Uh, there are two, two of my colleagues, uh, Chanak and Suho, uh, who are also part of this team, uh, experts. 
uh, and, and, and we could build this. So the beauty of it is data, the right tool, uh, and the right kind of people. We had a hackathon there, and so there were experts from the King's College, there were experts from TFL, uh, there were experts from our sides, and there were other people from the community who were contributing into you know, brainstorming ideas and so on and so forth. There were about 10 or 15 other solutions as well. We became the, the winner of this because we had, I think, superior kind of capability and the predictive feature that we have. Nobody has seen something like that before where you could kind of predict the traffic pattern in the next 15 minutes, 30 minutes, and about 80% accurate when you take a look at what Google tells you in 15 or 30 minutes. And these are totally based on CEP algorithms uh, and uh, the ML capability that we have in the data analytics server. Uh, so it was a great experience. So now, what TFL can actually do with this, uh, they haven't started implementing it as yet. Obviously, for an institution like that, it'll take some time. Uh, this can project real-time traffic movement. Uh, it can handle uh, such a lot of events, 780 uh, uh, million events from about 14,000 different sensors. Uh, and, and you can predict possible traffic patterns in next 15 minutes, next 30 minutes, and so on and so forth. So this is a very good IoT use case uh, in a smart city setting. So this is about making use of data, sensors, capability, everything. Okay, so that's London. We do something similar in Amsterdam. So we work with our partner, Yenlo, there. Amsterdam is a beautiful city. Uh, lots of canals, uh, lots of uh, open spaces, nice place to walk, and so on and so forth. Lots of tourists in Amsterdam. People come for experience in the city, and so on and so forth. So there is this project. Amsterdam does a lot of things. Uh, one is the sustainability agenda. So Amsterdam wants to be a sustainable city. So, uh, you know, if, if, if you've been to Amsterdam, you know that they are un un under the, the seawater level, right? So sustainability has been in their blood for ages. Uh, so you, you, you need to be sustainable in many ways. Reduce pollution, uh, make the city energy efficient, uh, manage uh, the way you handle waste, and so on and so forth. Lots of initiatives, lots of great initiatives that they're doing. And Along these things, uh, they have got a few apps uh, about running the city in clean energy. And there is something called vehicle to grid. This is a very interesting thing. So you imagine you buy a car that charges uh, using a battery, uh, 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 which, has a, which can be charged off a grid right? uh, using electricity. And then, and then it runs on this battery. right? Uh, imagine that you can plug the car again and uh, you know, donate back some of the charge that you have to the grid. Netherlands is interested in doing that. And vehicle to grid is all about that. So when you have many Teslas available around you, which apparently they believe they have, you can plug them and then boot up the entire city out of it. So interesting concept, right? So they're looking at things like this. Because you know it sounds like a joke. But the reality is, if the future is going to be uh, emissionless, right? there'll be lots of electric vehicles. And then there are requirements of, you know, uh, people don't need the charge always, right? They may charge the car, and they may want, uh, the, some cars may charge when they are dr being driven, likewise. And we are talking about Teslas as cars, right? But there can be trains, there can be trucks, there can be all kinds of vehicles that can contribute back to the power grid. So it's a very interesting project uh, that explores these options. So being, being efficient, right? The sustainable city uh, goes beyond that, right? This is about helping a tourist uh, survive in Amsterdam. So Yenlo did this project called the Beacon Mile. Uh, so the public and the tourists are trying to find the way around in Amsterdam. So you can use this nice application uh, that interacts with iBeacons placed around the city. So if, 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 you're, if you're strolling along, if you have a walk by yourself and you want to understand Amsterdam without paying any of the tour guides or anything like that, just take a look at the app. Just walk along, and, and this suggests what you, um, what you should be looking at. This gives you information of exactly what you're looking at, and it's an interesting idea. So it's like you are on your own, a solo traveler, learning about Amsterdam with nothing at all uh, but this app. So this is a great thing, and it's about, it's about <laughs> being sustainable in terms of interacting with tourists, they say. Uh, so you are not needing to print out uh, traditional maps. Uh, you don't need to be posting all these kinds of signboards and everything like that to help tourists. You may have that, but in the future you may not need that. Um, you are also promoting the key attractions to the traveler. 
uh, without having to put any additional marketing budget and all these kinds of investment. This is a cute little app to use. And it gives you all of these instructions um, uh, and everything like that, good, uh, uh, you, you know, like interactions like that. And, and, and then the tourists can make use of it. And, and for the city point of view, that's a great saving. So this is a great project. Now we have similar things in other areas as well. So this is the third project. Now this is from Andalusia uh, in the south of Spain. There is a project about making the entire south of Spain uh, a, a smart uh, city, like a, a very big uh, smart city, like this is spanning across several cities in this case. So uh, this is also with another partner of ours, Chakrai, another premier partner. Uh, they are working um, uh, with uh, the local entities, the local cities, uh, to build a great platform that allows all of these objectives to be met. So smart economy, uh, smart housing, uh, providing better services for people, uh, uh, better environment, mobility, uh, and also the overall control of it, getting statistics, everything like that, to, to become smart in every aspect. So they've got a platform uh, that they're working on. So what does this platform does? The, the platform is obviously IT, uses middleware and things like that. How does this help build smart environment? So all of these sensors that are there in you know, fields like these things, I was watching a YouTube video that they've done. It's in Spanish, but I think they've, uh, they've got some translations available if you want to go through. Uh, explains um, how you can keep track of ideal conditions, temperature, humidity, uh, you know, weather conditions and everything, and, and, and uh, make use of this technology to, to get the best crop produced uh, out of your farm. Now, if a farmer was to understand these things by their own, uh, they would have to be paying, you know, mostly uh, private institutions and so and so forth, right? Uh, all, all, also, if uh, one farmer decides to do one thing, another farmer decides to do another thing, likewise, uh, lots of farmers doing different things, they don't quite sync well. So when you sell your crop, they don't all come at the same time. So Spain, as a country or region, can't produce and, and then sell because they don't align very well, right? So just like we want to align technology, uh, the government uh, of southern Spain wants to align their produce. Uh, so if the government uh, can provide all of this information or aggregate information coming from multiple private data sources, right? Uh, they can go with a unified strategy. Uh, this is what they're looking at. So to improve everything across the board uh, as a public service. Uh, so uh, similarly, they're looking at uh, being efficient in healthcare, uh, being efficient in uh, every other aspect of uh, using the environment and so on and so forth. Uh, so that's, that's uh, reducing pollution, uh, improving uh, you know, quality of life. Uh, it's, it's a great project that they're doing. So another interesting thing is uh, southern Spain has a lot of historical uh, uh, aspect to it. Uh, you find all, all of these uh, modern uh, things uh, in Spain. You also find uh, plenty of history. Uh, it's an interesting part of Spain to visit if you are into Moorish architecture and so on and so forth. So all of these things, all of these historical artifacts are to be preserved when you are improving um, the smartness of your city infrastructure, everything. So if you've been to Granada, you would notice the city uh, is not that uh, big. It's all very congested, the old part. Uh, and, and still, they want to be smart in the way they understand the interactions with the environment, their quality, everything, without damaging any of these beautiful buildings. So that's another part of the agenda. So great projects. There are lots of things to consider. Uh, you cannot, you, you have to be smart in one way, but you cannot cut down on every other way, right? So this is about sustainability, this is about being smart. Again, another great example. The fourth example, because my title says global, uh, is from Sao Paulo. So WSO2 works with, uh, again, uh, this is in, in Brazil. Uh, we work with uh, a company called CET. Uh, so CET is uh, uh, handling traffic movement in Sao Paulo. Uh, Sao Paulo is the largest city in uh, LATAM, the third largest in the world. Lots of vehicles, lots of people. And these guys are responsible for ensuring the coordination is very smooth. And, and for them, uh, they, use, uh, they used to use a lot of uh, paper-based technology. This graphic is from 2011. Uh, where you find a guy uh, keeping track of the congestion of the road, writing it on a piece of paper. If you visit the link there, the image credit, you will see this. Uh, now, they're not doing that. They're using Android devices for these things. 
So these Android devices, uh, now given out to many people, are, are good. You know, they're saving paper. Uh, they are they are helping uh, you know uh, uh, keep uh, you know like uh, the the environment by by reducing uh, you know uh, the amount of uh, use of paper by using Android devices. Great, uh, but these Android devices need to be coordinated. Uh, you need to understand what people are doing with it. Otherwise, the benefit of using Android is not realized. Right? It's just like an alternative to paper. Right? Because you can just record the same thing on that if it's not connected, if it's not interfaced with the systems that can understand what's being recorded right, in real time. That's, that's just like writing down something on a paper and then reading all of those papers at the end of the day. right? Same benefit. It's just not using paper for that. So what these guys did was they went and uh, made use of these things to uh, understand where the people operate, like the geo-localization uh, capabilities of our IoT server. Uh, they use analytics uh, to get a lot of things, and people would press buttons, and that's enough to understand certain things. Uh, and this translates into uh, better uh, enforcement of road rules, <coughs> better handling of traffic conditions, and so on and so forth, reporting accurate situations, uh, and now they are very coordinated. So my colleague, Edgar, uh, who is not here, was explaining, uh, we, we, had a, we had a small summit in, in Brazil where, where they've been speaking about these things. I think it's a recording. Uh, he was explaining to me how this has actually improved the city. Uh, and and uh, this is a very proud thing for CET to tell, that they've got a very connected infrastructure. They're really good. And it's also very proud uh, for us uh, to present this as a use case, because we are actually helping uh, the third largest city in the world uh, become more efficient in the way they handle traffic and all of these things. So, all of these things are, uh, you know, evolutionary things, uh, but we believe, um, uh, you know, this must not be a revolution, uh, because uh, you cannot, you cannot, uh, you cannot go ahead and make changes to a lot of infrastructure or, or make very rapid, uh, you know, like uh, introductions of these kinds of technology. I was talking about TFL's use case. We did a hackathon, but obviously they can adapt it the next day, right? That's not how it works. Uh, so uh, the benefit of using WSO2 in this case is we got lots of experience working on these kinds of projects. We are also doing, I think, Chakra is organizing an event in Spain uh, in uh, two weeks. Uh, we'll be going and talking to them, uh, explaining what, they, what we do in that region. But we also can take the same message, uh, give it to you in this region. So we got lots of experience working uh, with our wonderful partner community and lots of customers across uh, Europe and the globe. Uh, and then we got some context. And people like Sumeda, um, has, has a lot of experience coming out of all of these areas, all of these projects, feeding into what IoT server is. And our software is also used in uh, many other public uh, sector institutions. So even though you're looking at a transport use case today, right? if uh, GLA wants to expand what TFL does and integrate another project uh, into this, that's quite easy, because uh, we've got use cases again in public sector. We are quite strong in public sector. And, 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 and uh, the products that we have, uh, that we use, can be deployed on-premise, on cloud, serverless, uh, containers, likewise. Uh, so people can use uh, you know, traditional infrastructure to run our products, or they can, use, um, th th they can keep improving uh, in the future. So there are a few things that we, as a vendor of uh, middleware capability, can provide. There are a few things, uh, as a vendor who has experience working with customers in this space, that we can provide. Uh, there are also lots of examples. Like we can make people meet and 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 help them uh, share experiences. A unique thing that we do through conferences like this, right? So this is, I think, the benefit of uh, using WSO2. But there are other benefits. I think Sumeda and Chatura were highlighting some of those technical capabilities. These are benefits. But I think the main thing is about how to take a customer through a journey. Uh, you you need to go from A, B, C, D. And all of these steps before you get to Z, right? So it is a journey. And, and with all of these customers, I think the main thing that we've learned is the idea is to show them, to prove them uh, what you can do today with what you have, and to explain to them uh, what you can do with uh, many other things that you already have, but you don't realize um, after you have gone to that step. And iteration of, of uh, capability is, is, has, been, has been the key for most of these projects and to do things in a little way, then keep scaling, 
keep growing uh, to the next level, which IoT server uh, and all of our products for that purpose is really good at. And, and that has helped us a lot. Right. Thank you. I'm a little over time. Uh, anybody have any questions uh, on, on smart city projects or anything that we do with the IoT server in the public sector, anything like that, feel free to ask. Thank you. So no questions or? <laughs> right, no questions. Thank you.